Okay, so we're gonna be discussing a pelvic fracture and how we can manage these appropriately and give these patients the, the best management that they can possibly get in the EMS setting. And so that's what we're gonna be talking about today. So let's re quickly review this case so we can get started. And if you aren't a member yet, please feel free to join us uh, for free and check it out. And we are Master Medics, I'm the owner of Master Medics, and we have a, a subscription that you can get, a premium subscription that gives you access to all of these videos, all of the courses, anything that you could struggle with in school, we have a course for it. So all these kind of things are available to you as premium members. And if you're interested, you can join us on a three day free trial and check it out for yourself. And you can cut your study time in half and all the while raising your grades with us because of our visual approach. Okay, so here's the case. You are called to an 18 year old male patient who was hit by an ATV while walking down a dirt road. You find the patient unconscious, unresponsive, laying prone. Bystanders state that the ATV came up from behind and hit him and the patient went under the wheels of the ATV. The patient has multiple lacerations, contusions, and on assessment you find the left clavicle is fractured, left chest wall is unstable, and abdomen is soft, pelvis is unstable, when pushed anterior to posterior and left leg is stable but shortened. And you can see the presentation of the patient. Obviously some fractures, some injuries here, and they are recognizing they have some sort of signs of internal bleeding as well. So a lot going on uh, with this particular patient because of this trauma. Okay, so we do a set of vitals on this patient and we get this. Okay, we have a heart rate of 150, we have a blood pressure of 72 on 45 with a MAP of 54. ETCO2 is 28 with a breathing rate of 22. Okay, 84% of a saturation, so even though they're breathing 22, they're not getting great air entry. Um, and we have a poor pleth wave, which is pretty consistent with our low blood pressure. Their skin is normal, level conscious, unresponsive. Eyes are let, um, eyes, pupils, are both equal at four mils, temperature is normal, BGL is normal, okay? So based off what we see here, first question for you is, is this patient in compensated or decompensated state of shock? Compensated or decompensated state of shock. If you're thinking this patient is in a decompensated state of shock, you'd be absolutely correct. That's a pretty obvious answer uh, for this particular patient, but yes, you are correct. And we can see that by the elevated heart rate, so they're compensating, but those compensation factors are not working. And we can see that with poor perfusion or the blood pressure being low. So our compensation factors aren't maintaining the blood pressure, suggesting a decompensated state of shock. Okay, so there's a few different types of pelvic fractures and I wanna quickly go over them just so you can kind of get a feel for all of them here. And there's the anterior, posterior, a lateral compression and a vertical shear type of pelvic fracture, all of them which can have cause significant bleeding inside the pelvic girdle as well. Uh, but some of them are more likely to cause venous bleeds and other ones are more likely to cause arterial bleeds. But just judging by the presentation and the mechanism that we have, what do you feel this patient is suffering from what type an anterior posterior a lateral compression or a vertical shear go ahead and put that in the comments what do you think anterior posterior lateral compression or vertical shear when you are effectively run over by an atv what do you think If you're thinking anterior, posterior, you would be correct. And so this is basically a push down. If I was to bring the uh, my handy skeleton out here in front, anterior, posterior would be a compression from the fronts and the backs like so. And that is what we're seeing here is that we see basically a fracture from the joints, the SI joints, um, like you're seeing here, and it pushes the pelvic girdle out. So anterior, posterior compression is like that. Now, Let's look at the other ones just so we kind of understand the differences between them. Lateral compressions, these happen with motor vehicle collisions. And so a good example of this would be a, a T-bone collision where the impact is on the hip like so. A car hits another vehicle and puts a compression from the sides like so. And that creates a lateral compression that can cause a fracture of the SI joint, joint and other areas of the pelvic girdle. And finally, we have a vertical shear. Now vertical shears are a different 
um, type of reaction. And so think of them like a fall reaction. If you fall from a really high distance and you end up falling on the heel of your foot and all that pressure is gonna push up through the pelvic girdle, it's actually gonna shear. And so that's exactly what it is, is that this, there's a directional force that's pushing up on the pelvic girdle, causing the rupture, causing the fracture. So those are the three main types of pelvic fractures themselves. Uh, vertical shears have a very significant uh, or very often are, are a arterial bleed itself because of the anchoring points of where the art arteries are. And so when we shear up, it rips those vessels and can cause a lot of arterial bleeding. So these are pretty nasty bleeds if you have these. And so those are your uh, three types of of a pelvic fractures themselves. Um, we know that this particular patient is probably an anterior posterior based on the way that the tire would have ran over the patient. There does like vertical shear doesn't really make sense. Lateral, depending on how we hit them, maybe, uh, but the most likely one is anterior posterior. Does that change your treatment? No, but it's nice to understand the differences between um, the pelvic fractures for a few reasons. One of them being that when you're palpating, they actually fracture in different ways. And so anterior, posterior, most of the fractures are coming from the SI joint, but they're gonna have instability in different directions. So for example, if you are doing a palpation and you're pushing in on the iliac crest, you might not find instability, but when you push down on the iliac crest, you actually might find instability depending on the type of fracture. So it's important to make sure that you're doing not only a push in but a push down to see if there's any instability in both those directions because different types of fractures will cause different types of reactions and movements. Okay, so let's look at some of the internal anatomy of the pelvic girdle and the iliac crest itself. And what we have here is we have, I'm going to paint the, the arterial side on one side. This is just the main vessels. And then I'm gonna paint the venous side on the other. And so you have your common iliac artery, you have your internal iliac artery like so, and then you have your iliac artery that turns into your femoral artery that's on the far side here. The most, and then this little guy that you're seeing here, this is your gluteal artery. This kind of runs in uh, behind your pelvis, kind of towards your glutes, your muscles. So these are your main arteries that are kind of running in this area. Um, in arterial type of of bleeds, an arterial type of pelvic fractures where our artery is involved. It's typically this one here, the, the gluteal, is often the artery that's going to be affected just because of the way that it anchors and the direction that it goes, that when we have pelvic shears, this is the one that typically is going to be torn and that's gonna cause your arterial bleeds. So that's why I added it here. Even though it's a minor vessel, it is a, the most common for arterial bleeds inside the pelvis itself. Now, other side, we have the venous, okay? And these are running again back towards the heart itself. They have the similar names that we have with the arterioles except for their venous. And so my question to you is, what is more common in a pelvic fracture, venous bleeds or arterial bleeds? Go ahead, put that in the comments. So the answer to the question is, is that venous bleeds are the more common one um, and then arterial bleeds are the more dangerous one, okay? Our venous bleeds are the more common, arterial bleeds are the more dangerous ones because they're harder to stop. However, venous bleeds do have the ability to drain a lot of blood inside the pelvic girdle itself. Now, why is that? It's because there's not a lot of tamponade. Like when we get a bleed on our hand or our arm, we can put pressure on it in order to help slow and stop that bleed. But inside, when we have the venous side that, or a, a vein that's wrecked or damaged inside the pelvis, there's nothing to really put pressure on. There's no tamponade in there and so when they bleed they often bleed for quite some time slow but long times and this can cause a lot of decreases in in blood and so we can lose a lot of blood even from a venous bleed so we need to be sure or we need to be careful on both of these situations whether it's an arterial or a venous side of bleed we can expect different symptoms uh, and different progressions of shock because arterial ble bleeds will be much faster venous bleeds are going to be much slower but both of them can cause a decompensated state of shock because there's a lack of tamponade inside the pelvis that's going to slow or stop bleeds on their own
Okay, so let's talk a little bit about treatment. Now we have an understanding of these pelvic fractures and the directional pelvic fractures. We also have talked about the different types of bleeds that we can have. Let's talk about how we can help these patients. There's two big things that we need to do in order to help these patients. One, we can have some bleeding control, and two, we need to create some resuscitation, especially in this patient that's in a decompensated state of shock. So let's look at the two things that we can do in each of these categories. In bleeding control, there's really two things that we can do, okay? It's an internal bleed, and so we can use a pelvic binder, and we can use TXA. In resuscitation, the really only option in most ambulances is going to be isotonic fluids to maintain a MAP of 65, which our patient is not yet. So we will probably have to give them some fluids, and then ideally get them to blood products as fast as possible, so that way this patient has a chance of getting to surgery and treatment. Okay, so let's look at bleeding control first. First off, I wanna look at TXA first and then we're gonna bring the skeleton out to talk about pelvic binders. So TXA is a medication that can actually uh, promote the binding of clots. It doesn't, um, I, I, I don't wanna say that it creates or promotes binding. I wanna say that it, uh, when things are bound, it doesn't allow things to pull apart. Okay, and so when it comes to TXA, clots are formed and TXA is going to make sure that those clots stay formed. They're not going to break apart. That's what TXA does. Now the evidence with TXA is mixed and how beneficial it is. What we do know about TXA is two things. One, it is used or is best used when we give it as early as possible. Okay. As early as possible. And the second thing is that not only do we need to do a loading dose, which we give an EMS and ground EMS, but giving it in a maintenance dose as well. If you're doing any prolonged uh, transport with your patients. Okay. Those are the two things together that are going to help the prolonging of holding clots together. So that's one thing that I want to mention about TXA is that absolutely is it indicated for this patient for sure. There's very little downside in giving it in this patient and a quite a bit of potential upside, especially if we give it as early as possible. Okay. So let's talk about pelvic binders. Now, a question that I, might, I provided to you is, should we put pelvic binders on any patient that we're suspecting of a pelvic fracture? Um, even if we don't find instability? And the answer is yes. And the reason being is that there's, again, very little downside in using a pelvic binder. And if you are unsure if you can feel any instability, then giving a pel then doing a pelvic binder is going to improve upon, um, improve upon the blood pressure. So if there is a slow bleed, if there is a venous bleed and you can't quite feel any instability, we can create tamponade with a pelvic binder. So if you're unsure, if you feel instability, it is time to put that pelvic binder on. Okay. Even if you can't feel the instability, it's a really important point because it's taught a lot of time is that you need to feel instability in order to put a pelvic binder on. That is not the case. It's not an indication of fracture. If you find instability, absolutely it is. But if you don't find it, it doesn't mean that there isn't a fracture that's causing bleeding. Okay. So where do we place a pelvic binder? Well, regardless if you're using blankets or you're using an actual commercial pelvic binder, the key is to find the greater tro trochanter of the femur. So this guy right here, okay? That's what you're looking for in order to kind of get yourself a landmark. And so what you're gonna do is you're gonna take this pelvic binder and you're gonna line it up and make sure that the greater tro trochanter is covered like so, okay? So this is more where you're gonna landmark this pelvic binder, okay? is like so on the femurs okay a lot of the time we're finding that when we are when we're dealing with pelvic binders or any type of uh, blankets that are used as a pelvic binder we find them very high because you find the top of the iliac crest and just place it below like that and that's too high it's actually not creating as much tamponade as we need so we need to make sure that we're landmarking properly and just slide it down like so so that way it's covering the greater trochanter of the, um, of the femur. So that way the pelvic binder is in a solid spot like so. So that would be near perfect is it's covering there and it's covering a lot of the pelvic girdle itself. A lot of these vessels up here, these are not the ones that rupture. The ones that rupture are down below in the lower portions of the pelvis. And so having the, the pelvic uh, binder up here is not putting any tampon on, on the vessels we want it to. That's why we have to bring it down here. So that's how you are gonna apply a pelvic binder and where you're gonna apply a pelvic binder. And of course, when you're gonna apply a pelvic binder. And that is when you have a high enough mechanism or if you feel instability or your patient has significant pain.
Okay, so that's bleeding control. Those little two big things that we can really do. There's not much else that we can help this patient with other than those two things. So now that we've had those in place, let's talk about resuscitation. Now, as you know, if you've watched any of my videos, I'm not a big advocate of normal saline. The evidence in normal using normal saline in trauma patients and traumatic hemorrhage patients is extremely poor. It is terrible. It is not a benefit in patients. But that being said, we don't have the ability to use blood a lot of the time on a ground ambulance. And so what normal saline can be used for, isotonic fluids can be used for in this particular situation is to buy us time. That's what it's gonna be used for. And by buy us time, meaning that we are going to use isotonic fluids to maintain a map of 60 to 65, okay? So permissive hypotension and buy us time to get to blood. Once we get to blood, then we switch to blood and use blood for resuscitation because we've done our time. We've bought this patient enough time to get to the hospital or get to a blood product, and now we're gonna to switch to blood. That is what we're gonna be focusing on when it comes to resuscitation. So again, fluids only used to buy you time, maintain a pressure, a map of 60 to 65, and maintain that and buy them time until you can get to blood. Once you have blood, then you switch to blood and start using it. That is the most appropriate way to uh, to approach this type of resuscitation so that way we do not fill them up with a bunch of normal saline that has no oxygen carrying capacity and causes significant problems to our patient down the road. So um, I want to make sure that was very clear that that's the order of things and that is your indication to stop and that is maintaining a blood pressure of 65. And your pelvic binder might actually improve that. So if you start your fluids before your pelvic binder is on, usually not going to be the case, but if that is the case, then check a blood pressure after your pelvic binder is on, and you might find that that pelvic binder helps improve central pressures, and you might see the blood pressure go up. So you may not even need as much fluid as you think because that pelvic binder is going to help to improve that blood pressure. So run a blood pressure after it's done, confirm that you're still below a, a map of 65, and if you are, use fluids in order to maintain that level and then get them to blood products or get them to a hospital so they can start to prepare for surgery and also resuscitate with blood products. Okay, so uh, that's what we've covered today. We've covered different types of pelvic fractures. We've uh, covered the fact that this patient uh, has likely maybe an arterial or venous bleed, but we can have both of them in the pelvis. We've covered how to use pelvic binders and when to use them and making sure that we're using them when we find pain, when we find any instability, as well as if we have a high enough mechanism that suggests it as well, and any type of injuries around the pelvis that would suggest it too. Uh, we've talked about how to manage bleeding control with a pelvic binder binder as well as TXA and finally we've talked about resuscitation and using fluids only to maintain pressure of a map of 65 and blood, getting them to blood products as fast as possible. So if you have any questions please feel free to reach out. I'm more than happy to chat.